because she had these experiences, she developed her consciousness of herself as a woman and a woman whose rights were limited by a male patriarchy, if you will. Sure, and she got to see firsthand what rights a human being needs to function in a society. Would Correct. Correct. However, I wouldn't exaggerate that. Um, I don't consider her a feminist. She, I, and I call it, I call it woman's consciousness or consciousness of being a woman, and that that is different from human consciousness. And so, while she was aware of her. Um, struggles as a woman and their being different from men's struggles, she didn't want to overthrow the society as it was and the political world as it was. She did not ask for the vote. She did not want representation in Congress. That was so far beyond her kind of thinking. But she's, she's what I call a proto-feminist, actually. She became aware that things weren't right in her world. For instance, when John went away, and left her in charge of the farm. She had farm hands to direct, and so she would give instructions to the farm hands, and they wouldn't obey her. And she would struggle to get these farm hands to obey her, and they wouldn't. And they also left to join the army, and so, so she had all of these uh, um, difficulties because she was a woman that John, as a man, didn't experience. If he gave an instruction, men followed his rules, sure. and that didn't happen to her. So what she, but even greater than that, for instance, as she took over the family economy um, and she started, for instance, purchasing land, yeah. she couldn't own it. She had to purchase it in John's name. So she did all of the research and the um, gathering of funds to purchase land or Securities, which she also purchased, she became very astute as an economist. That was something that she, she hadn't done previous to John's going away. But she couldn't own any of it in her own name. It had to be in his name. Because a woman who was married owned nothing of her own. Not even her own clothes. They belonged to her husband. So those were the conditions. I mean, she was starting at the very bottom when she was asking for women's rights. She wasn't yes. thinking of great political rights. Right. Mm. So in reading your book, we're not going to see a feminist, somebody who is out to use the political force to make changes, but we're going to see the evolution of female consciousness toward greater rights. Would That's that be correct. correct? It's we're, the beginning. And we're also going to see the environment mm -hmm. that a woman of that time, and mm -hmm. a man at that time, what their environment was right. like that right. helped lead to changes. Right. That's correct. Yes. Now, um, I'm just wondering, what would our friends in the Arab world think of your book? First, it'll have to get translated. It's going to be a big job. Um, probably, I would, I, 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 unless you have very educated people reading it, people who understand American history and the context in which this occurs, um, it, it, it's not going to be very meaningful. So people would have to be pretty cosmopolitan, sophisticated, in order to understand what the conditions of life were like in colonial America. And while we press on women's rights for that period, and that's what Abigail is best known for, the fact of the matter is that they were fighting a revolution to make a nation. And they were fighting to break away from Great Britain because of all of the intolerable issues that came up between the colonies and England. And that was uppermost in people's mind. That was uppermost in Abigail's mind. And it was certainly uppermost in John's mind. So I would imagine if they read my book, uh, it would have to do with how to make a revolution. So, you know, in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Saudi Arabia, Yemen, uh, there is a mindset very similar to the mindset that Abigail Adams had and was in that environment, is it? I would, I, I, you know, I can't really say that because there's such a cultural gap there. I would say Abigail's mindset was closer to women of 
her time in England, or um, maybe, um, I suppose, China or Japan today, uh, where women's rights are just being attended to and things are just beginning to change and women are just going into the work world. And women are becoming conscious that change can happen for them in their lives. I don't know how, um, except in a very, th th there are feminists in all of the Mideastern countries and Southeast Asian countries. There are feminists and they're trying to bring a message, but it's a, a different kind of feminism. It's a feminism which still wears the veil okay. and maybe the burqa. Now, you know it takes a tremendous amount of work to write a book, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Oh, it does. It's also fun, Michael. It's very fun. Yes. All right. it's, so it's, it's, yeah. But it's more than fun now. Yes, it's work. Uh, what is it in you that drives you to write a book like you've just written? Curiosity, interest. I mean, I find it so interesting. I find biography interesting. I've always read biography. I like knowing about other people. But for some reason, I resonate with the 18th century, yeah. uh, which may have to do with growing up in upstate New York and being close to New England and small town life and so forth. I mean, there are a whole lot of reasons which I, th for which I think I, I resonate with the um, colonial past in America. Um, so I, I, I love studying that era. Um, and I, I enjoy learning about people's lives and speculating about people's lives and thinking about what's the same and what's different between them and me. Okay. Now I'm wondering, was there a day when you suddenly in saw in vision this stack of Abigail Adams letters and you said to yourself maybe no historian had has really gone out and grabbed onto them and focused really intensely and mined them for everything you could right. get out. Did, did you have that kind of... There were a couple of biographies about Abigail before my time but every biography that I read of Abigail made John the protagonist <laughs> because the things he did were more dramatic. John ran a revolution. John made war with England. John got to think about making sure. a constitution. Abigail stayed at home, ran the farm, did the laundry, took care of the kids. I mean, her, her, her daily life wasn't spectacular the way John's life was spectacular. So when people wrote biographies about Abigail, what happened was they focused on John as being more interesting. So she'd be there, but it was always that the story always slipped into his life. I wrote my first two biographies topically as opposed to chronologically. And what I did was I chose topics from women's world to focus on motherhood, um, daughter, being a daughter, having sisters, women working together, the kinds of work that women's do, the relationship that women had among themselves. Um, and so I, by, by keeping the focus on topics during that period, um, I was able to write about her with John in the background. So you found a special little niche. I did. That, th I did. that resonates with a lot of mm -hmm. people, I would assume. Mm -hmm. And in observing your books, would I be correct to say your first two books were more of an academicness? Yes. Yeah, they are. But you've now evolved because this is much, I wouldn't call it pop by any means, but it, it's moved more into a, a different genre. Yes, it is. It's, it's chronological and it follows both of their lives. And Possibly it's written um, with a lot less theory. The other books are very much bound up in feminist theory and lots of psychology and sociology and so forth. I used a lot of theory in my first books to yes. try to explain why women's lives were important. And in that sense, they were academic. And this one is, the, the theory isn't there anymore. I know them. I know, I, I, not that I, prepared you for any of my questions, but can you remember a section, a paragraph that you would like to read that you, you're, you are especially proud of? Any come to mind? 
Oh my goodness. Um,